sometimes hang a church meeting in Ridgeway, sort of like a dance group, and so we, we travel here each week, but we're here, and it's good to be with you. Above all, though, I think we're here to worship God, and that's wonderful. And today we're going to be helped in doing that by Bishop Michael, who's come to lead our service and preach. And I do hope that you have a good conversation with him afterwards, if you haven't already. I saw many of you chatting, and I think that's wonderful. But uh, Bishop Michael. Oh, I can take the mask off and I'm safe from the glasses steaming up past an hour. Well, good morning, everybody. It's lovely to be with you here at Pantanga today and lovely to be with everyone who's online with us as well. Great to see you here today as well. So, Michael, uh, last time I was here was for Paul's licensing. Licensing, getting it started. Launching, whatever it was, and, and that was a wonderful occasion when we had David Chapman preaching to us from the Methodists and Stephen Coxon from the Baptists here, Andrew from the URC, not a wonderful occasion of celebration of the four denominations that make up your church that evening. Um, but it's lovely for me to be with you today, so thank you so much for having me. We're going to start now by listening to our songs. How do we do that, people? We hand over. We hand over. <laughs> that sounds really good. I'm going to do all the people and care for you. Yeah, right. well, welcome from up here. Uh, I'd like to stand if you're willing, maybe we're just going to come into God's presence this morning. I'm just going to sing a few songs. I'm going to sing a few songs. You may be able to hum and maybe <laughs> sing behind your mask. Um, but let, let's come into God's presence as we sing. <laughs> Oh, 
for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Come back before the end is regular and As we rest in that presence, let's say together the prayer of preparation. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and for whom no secrets are open, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly know and worthy magnify your queen through Christ our Lord. Amen. And in the presence of God, let us say sorry to God for any times during the past days or weeks 
when we fail to love God or our neighbour or ourselves as we should have done. And so let's join in the words of the confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought and word and deed. We have not loved you in our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours and sisters. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness. And keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In Christ, we are set free. Through Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. 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 I invite now our Bible reading. Six, Rejection of Jesus of Nazareth. He left that place and came to his hometown. His disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogues, but many who heard him were astounded. They said, Where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of Joseph and Joseph, and Judas and Simon, that are not his sisters here with us? And they took offence at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honour, except in their own town, and among their own kin, and in their own house. He could do no deed of power there, except he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed in their unbelief. Then he went among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two, and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag. No money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, Wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you, and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony to get you. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. This is the word of the Lord. You might want to have that Bible reading handy if you put it close by you. May I speak in the name of the living God and his Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, my wife and I, both of us, grew up in very, very small villages. Uh, my home village, I was there yesterday, has about 30 houses. It used to have a pub and a post office. The post office shut, so now it's got 30 houses and a pub. Uh, this looks like some kind of cos uh, cosmopolitan mecca to my wife, who grew up in a, house, in a village with about 20 houses with no pub and uh, no post office either. What you discover if you grow up in an environment like that is that everybody knows everything about you pretty well. Uh, there are very, very few surprises to be had in our villages about any of us. So much so that my wife says that her indicator of too much proximity when she's at home is when she looks around the room and she says, how many people here have changed my nappy? <laughs> when we hear this Bible reading, 
from Mark's Gospel about Jesus speaking to the people in the synagogue in Nazareth. But we have to remember that at the time when Jesus was there, the population of Nazareth, now quite a big city if you go there, but back in the day, the population of Nazareth, Nazareth, we reckon, was no more than about 500 people. So when Jesus came back to speak to his home village, I would say, not really a town, there would have been a sense there that everybody knew everything about him. And therefore, when he starts to act with power and authority, the power and authority he has, it's not exactly surprising that the response of people there is one of confusion. This is their local boy suddenly behaving, doing things that are very different to what they expect. And as a result, it's very difficult for them to see Jesus for who he is. So in the scripture it says, so I'm taking my glasses off, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and, you know, brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and we know his sisters as well, are they not here with us? So what, what on earth is he doing? How is he making these claims about himself? How is he acting with the authority with which he is. How is this possible, the people ask? Now, we can look at that with our perspective, but I wonder whether often there are some similarities in our own experience as well. Let me give you an analogy of this. I am incredibly bad at drawing and art. In fact, I'm so bad at it that when we had art exams at school, I used to get told to start again halfway through. Uh, uh, and now it's really galling to me that my 10-year-old son is considerably better at art than I will ever, ever, ever be. He looks at me, do. I mean, even when he was very small, he would look at me draw an elephant for him and that give a kind of three-year-old expression of, is that the best, really? <laughs> So I'm trying to understand why it is that I am so bad at art. And apparently, for people like me, the problem is that we don't draw what's in front of us, we draw what we think is in front of us. So if I was to, to, to draw a picture of Paul this morning, my interpretation onto paper would not be this, this vision of beauty that's before me. <laughs> your minister. It would be my conception of Paul, which might not be nearly so pretty. Very much that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think when we hear this gospel of Jesus in his hometown, his home village, and this reaction that happens to him, yes, we can say, well, of course, because they all think they know the story about Jesus, so they don't get who he really is. But I think for me, it, it prompts me to ask, what's the story that I think I have about Jesus? Is it, is it a reality that I've constructed and that makes me see Jesus as I wish to see him, as I project him to be, rather than who he really is? What am I blind to in Jesus? What am I not seeing? What am I not understanding? Uh, and how do I enlarge my vision to see Jesus for who he really is? How do I get out of the echo chambers that I end up in where I just hear the story about Jesus, which is the one I want to hear, not the Jesus who wants to break into my life, uh, and turn it upside down. That's what I take from this gospel text. So what does Jesus do in response to his 
rejection by his home people in Nazareth. Well, he does something very creative. He changes the terms of reference. He finds ways of enabling those around him to gain a different perspective. What he does is he goes out to the villages around Nazareth, Galilee, and begins to send out his disciples two by two uh, to engage with those that live there. And what Jesus does with his disciples to help them gain a fresh perspective as well is he strips them right back to essentials. He says to them, don't take with you all that panoply of stuff that normally you carry because it protects you and it defends you and it prepares you against all eventualities. Don't take all that stuff. So he says in Mark 6, well, uh, 8, he ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. No bread, so nothing to eat, no packed lunch, no bag, not all their useful bits, their first aid kit, their mobile phone, uh, all the things that they normally had. I suppose they didn't. Uh, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. Did you hear that lovely girl who went up Wimbledon yesterday saying her mum and dad had said, why are you packing so much stuff? You're going to be back on Tuesday. <laughs> um, and there she was. She one of them. She said, the first thing I've got to do is go to the laundry before it was wonderful. No, but Jesus is saying to his disciples, don't take with you all that you normally do to ensure that you'll be fine in your own strength as you go out to the community around you. Go just as yourselves and see afresh what God will do amongst you. Go out. And I'm sure that the disciples were absolutely terrified because I have done this myself. Uh, a few years back, I used to be on the staff of one of the Church of England's theological colleges in Cambridge called Westcott House. Uh, and to, to put this text into action, every year we used to do something called the Westcott Walkabout, where we used to send our students out two by two to engage the citizens of Cambridge in conversation. Uh, and we sent them out with two questions to equip them for this task. We got them to go up to perfect strangers in the street and ask them two questions. The first was, excuse me, can I ask you for some advice? Um, which were all suckers for that, believe me. It's the most uh, inoffensive way to get into conversation with anybody else you could allow them to meet. So by and large, people always said yes. Then we had dressed up our students in t-shirts like this. And we got them to say to the people they met uh, when they'd offered this advice, I'm a trainee vicar, what advice would you give me? And it always led to the most extraordinary conversations uh, for a whole day around the centre of Cambridge uh, and opened our eyes to different perspectives, different ways of seeing the world, different ways that people wanted to experience faith. Now, what does this say to, to us, to you here? gathered in Panshanger this morning. I, I felt when I read this text, I couldn't think of a better one to come and share with you this morning. Because it seems to me that, that all of us in churches at the moment are without our normal bags, belts, monies, two tunics. All of us, because of the pandemic, have been thrust into situations and circumstances where we're without our usual mechanisms that we have to surround ourselves to make things all right. And you're even more so than other churches. They're largely still in their own buildings. And yet here you are, meeting out of your building in this school. 
and we're not singing, which is a great loss to us all, and we're all sitting apart, and we're wearing masks, and we've had coffee afterwards. We've been stripped back at this time. Perhaps the question I think I ask you and I ask us all is, we could just experience all of that as a loss, uh, as lack, as being without. But might there be ways to think about this as opportunity as well? In our strict back state, in your strict back state, might there be fresh things that God's saying to you about how to engage in mission as the first disciples went out into the villages of Galilee all those years ago? Might there be ways for you to think about mission afresh? During this time, what does it mean to be the people of God charged with the message of the kingdom when we have none, none of the usual mechanisms and none of the usual safety nets that would surround us in ordinary time? But then, just two final observations about this text. You see, sometimes I think when we think about engaging in mission and evangelism and sharing our faith with those around us, we can fall into the trap of thinking that we have to go with all the answers. That we have to go as people sent out to fill up empty vessels that are around us who need the gospel and that, that our job is to go and tell them the good news. But I think if you look at this text, what Jesus asks of the people he sends, his disciples that he sends, he asks of them something very different. Look again at verse 10. Jesus said to them, wherever, when, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. It seems that when Jesus sends out his disciples, he's clearly expecting them to receive the hospitality of the people to whom he sends them. Because they don't have their bag, their money, their tunic, or that other problem, they're going to need to be looked after by the people to whom they go. So receiving is just as much a part of Jesus' model of reaching out to those about him as his giving. And I think this, for me, I, I think this is the question that when we engage in mission, that we're finding it really hard to get our heads around. How can we go out in mission to those around us, expecting that part of that will be us receiving of them? When we encounter others, what are we expecting them to offer into the equation? And then finally, there's this last very freeing command that Jesus gives. In Mark 6, he says this. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. I, I think what Jesus is saying there is work with what you can, not with what you can't. And don't agonize when the answer is no. Shake off the dust from your feet and move on to the next place. Risk a bit of failure and then move on because it's not the end of the world. No. For me, I, you would think, you would, we would think that church, as the people of the resurrection, we would have less fear of risk than anybody else in the world. And yet, it's just so often not the case. And we're often paralyzed by it. Uh, what would it be like if we took those words of Jesus at heart and said, let's give it a go. If it doesn't work, 
Well, we'll move on to the next thing. It would free us so much, would it not? So, lovely Panzheimer Church, my invitation to you is to take up the challenge that Jesus lays before you in Mark chapter 6. The challenge of, for all of us, letting go of our preconceptions, who Jesus is, what he's about, and what he expects of us. Wouldn't it be amazing if Jesus could break into our lives afresh, turn them upside down, and help us see the world through his eyes, not as we expect to see it. Jesus challenges us to step out in faith and receive what is offered when we meet the people to whom we are sent, knowing that the worst thing that can happen is that folk will say no. Because the prize of this text is phenomenal. Let's look just at the very last verse of Hans, verse 13. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. Now, okay, this is Mark's gospel. It's this picture language that we get that is in some ways very alien to us now. I, I don't generally walk down the main street of well Garden City expecting to see demons. But I think there are demons within our culture and around us in our society. Demons of domestic violence, mental ill health, however we want to call them. There's the sickness of lives that are empty and where folk are unloved and don't know their true value. Jesus invites us to be part of building his kingdom, of curing of bringing wholeness of body and mind and spirit to those around us, of bringing peace and reconciliation, of bringing joy and love. That's what's on offer in a text like Mark chapter 6. May we take it and may we live it. Amen. Amen. Thank you for valiant, uh, swerving reading. Fantastic job. Thank you very much. We're now going to uh, hear in song again, I will offer up my life in spirit and truth. What a fantastic response uh, to that reading from Mark. I will offer up my life in spirit and truth, pouring out your love as my worship to you. In surrender, I must give my every part. Lord, receive the sacrifice of a broken Jesus, what can I do? What can I do to so faithful love you? To so love you? Say, no, I can't be What can I say? As the days I love you, all of the things you have done, all my thoughts. You deserve my every breath for you and the love of giving up your life to death, even death on the cross. You took all the shame away, everything to my sin. 
standing, let's affirm our faith in God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in his Son, Jesus Christ, who redeemed the world? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in his Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God? I believe and trust in This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, God, and Son, and the Holy Spirit. Would you please be seated for our prayers and intercession? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come together to give you all the praise for your creation of this wonderful world. For the love that you have shown to all people, for your Son, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. We offer up our prayer for all the people of the world who suffer from COVID. We pray that more vaccines will be made available to countries overwhelmed by the virus. We bring South American countries to you. We pray also for those in India overwhelmed by the disease. We pray for the Middle East still being torn by conflict that peace talks can be fruitful. We pray for Eritrea that the warring devils will come to a peaceful conclusion. Lord of all, we give thanks for your church seeking to spread the good news of your love for us. We pray that through our actions and prayers, more people will come to know and love the Lord Jesus, your precious Son, who died that we may be redeemed. As the country comes out of lockdown, we pray that we may return to witness and serve our community from our churches. We give thanks that we have been able to have fellowship through the wonder of electronic communication. We look forward to being able to serve our community, 
seeking ways to communicate to the local schools as the children are our future. <coughs> we pray that the nurses, health workers, and carers in our care homes in and around the Panthanger will avoid COVID. And we thank them for their devotion as they work beyond all the demands placed upon them. Lord of all, we pray for your healing touch on those who are sick, in body, mind, or spirit. We pray for those known personally to us, and we ask that you will return them to full health. <coughs> We pray for those who have departed this earth and pray that they are with you. We pray for those who are mourning the loss of their loved ones. Comfort them and give them the assurance that they may know that they are celebrating a new relationship with you in heaven. We offer this and all our prayers in the name of Jesus, our Saviour and Redeemer. Amen. Amen. If you're able to, please would you stand? <coughs> Christ is our peace. Through him we have access to the Father. We meet in his name and we share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let's offer one another a sign, a wave, whatever is right. The Lord is here. He is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right. It is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give thanks and praise to you, Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Through him you have freed us from the slavery of sin, giving him to be born of a woman and to die upon the cross. You raised him from the dead and exalted him to your right hand on high. Through him you have sent upon us your holy and life-giving spirit and made us a people of your own. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, evermore praising you, and say, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of our hand, heaven and earth are full of your glory, and stand in us. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood. Who on the night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you shall drink it, in remembrance of me. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. 
Therefore, Heavenly Father, accept through him our great high priest this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours forever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, and power, and glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Draw near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave me, and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. So in Thanksgiving, <coughs> Christ communion with us. Let's listen to the song and be the Father's love for us.
Let's say it together. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, and giving us a full taste of the heavenly banquet and for all people. Through him, we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice, such as a sight of the power of your spirit to live and work to our presence. Would you please stand? The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son Jesus Christ our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.